Hello and welcome to Beyond Belief, where we feature fascinating people of diverse backgrounds and viewpoints striving together for meaning and integrity. And today is no exception. And we have a wonderful guest for you, which I'm excited to introduce to you. But before we get started, please look below and just hit that subscribe button to stay on top of all the great programming that we have here at AISH. My guest today is Dr. Stuart Firestein. And he is a professor of neuroscience and the former chair of Columbia University's Department of Biological Sciences. Dr. Firestein is dedicated to promoting the accessibility of science to a public audience and serves as an advisor to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation's Program for the Public Understanding of Science. He has two books on the workings of science for a general audience, one's called Ignorance, How It Drives Science, which was released by Oxford University Press, and a second book, which I have right next to me here, called Failure, why Science is So Successful. These books together have been translated into 12 different languages. It's my pleasure to bring onto the show Dr. Stuart Firestein. Hi, Doctor. How are you? Fine, thank you. Fine, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward thank to Thank you so much. I, I've been looking forward to this conversation and uh, have enjoyed your work and your material for a long time. So it's really a pleasure to have you on the show. My pleasure. Um, so just to get things started, I like to ask people of a scientific background, you know, um, my daughter uh, is taking a chemistry class at the moment and gosh, you know, she is struggling with that. And, um, you know, for a lot of people, science is just a tough nut to crack. And I just wondered, like, how do you get involved? What, you know, what attracted it? What attracted you to science? Oh, this is probably a longer story th than you really want to know about. Um, I'll try to make it a little bit short. Actually, I spent um, my my initial years post high school, at least I worked in the theater for many years. I worked in the professional theater uh, at doing many things, but eventually rising to become a director. And that's what I did for a number of years for a living. And then when I was 30 years old, actually, I decided to go back to school uh, in science. I was interested in animal behavior and things of that nature. Initially, I had some ideas about doing a some sort of a theater piece about human and animal relationships. And I thought I would go take a course in, in animal behavior, animal communication. I was in San Francisco at that time. So I went to the local state university, San Francisco State University, took a class from a wonderful professor named Hal Markowitz, who I'm sorry to say passed away a few years ago, but he was a great mentor. And I, um, I hadn't been to college because in those days, uh, if you wanted to work in the theater, you just apprenticed yourself to people. You didn't really go to college for that. So I'd never been to college. Here I was 30 years old and I'm sitting in this classroom and this fellow stands up there and tells me everything he knows about something. And I thought, well, this is really remarkable. Who thought of this? This is very cool. I mean, as it turns out, I think Aristotle thought of it or somebody like that quite a while ago, but I was just catching up. Anyway, I took this class and I found it fascinating. So I wound up taking some more of it. And uh, eventually Hal Markowitz convinced me I should become a take get a major get a degree that is in um, in biology so i thought well okay so here here's actually an interesting perhaps at least useful uh, um, uh, useful look at, at chemistry at least for your daughter i thought well uh, if i'm going to take biology or try and get a major a, a degree in biology the first thing you have to worry about is passing organic chemistry or what they call orgo which is kind of a weed out course you know and um so I hadn't had chemistry in quite a long time since high school. So I thought, well, I'll take a semester of general chemistry, then I'll try organic. Because if I can't pass that, what's the sense of doing this? So that's what I did. And then I got to organic chemistry. And of course, the, the big sticking point in organic chemistry, as I'm sure your daughter is finding out, is that it's a lot of memorization. You just have to memorize one reaction scheme after another. And it's a huge amount of memorization. There are fundamental principles, but it's very time consuming to build from them to a reaction. In any case, you have to do a lot of memorization. And that's what trips everyone up. But of course, I'd spent 20 years in the theater doing nothing but memorizing scripts. So memorizing for me was kind of a trivial thing to do. And so I aced organic chemistry, actually, uh, using nice developed in the theater. And then I was on my way. I love that. I, uh, I, I love the combination of the arts and, um, and the sciences. Um, and what a unusual combination, but, um, I think that you, uh, you have a gift for combining, uh, unusual ideas and to start off, um, I'd like to reference one of your books, uh, failure, 
um, which I read and loved and think is fascinating. And I, you start each chapter with a quote, you know, and I'd like to just read two of them and then in a second ask a question based on them. Sure. The first one is from Gertrude Stein, which is a real failure does not need an excuse. It is an end in itself. Okay, I love that. There you go. Yep. And the second one is ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. And that's by Samuel Beckett. Okay, so based on those two ideas, um, we hear a lot of phrases like, you know, failure is not an option or too big to fail. So what does it mean to fail better considering the lack of popularity of failure in general? Yes, it's, this is, uh, I think, an important question because failure is, uh, has, has a generally pejorative sense to it, but I think that's wrong. I think that's a mistake. And, um, but, but and of course, the, the, the other side of that that people will tell you is the sort of tech industry idea of fail fast, fail hard, or fail hard, fail fast, whichever way it goes, or something like that, which is the idea of, you know, you can learn from failure, so do your failure thing, and then eventually you find success. But I don't agree with either of those. I neither think it's a pejorative term, nor do I think it's merely a step towards success. I mean, it may be that occasionally. Of course, we learn from failure. But I don't think, I, I prefer Gertrude Stein's idea about failure, although it's a somewhat enigmatic statement, as you might expect from Gertrude Stein, that it's an end in itself, that a fail, failure is not important only retroactively because it eventually led you to some success or some idea. It has the same cachet, the same importance, the same valence, if you will, or value as a success does. You learn as much from a failure as a success, maybe more. So, um, for example, uh, I would say, um, well, this is interesting. Uh, I don't know exactly when when this uh, interview will be will be seen by people, but as you know, yes, yesterday, uh, Donald Rumsfeld passed away, our former Secretary of Defense. I actually didn't know that. Okay, uh, he did, and and of course, he had become famous for making this statement, um, in which he talked about uh, in a Senate uh, inquiry, he talked about the things we didn't know, the known unknowns the, or the things we knew the known knowns and the things we didn't know the known unknowns but then the real trouble was the unknown unknowns the things right. we didn't know we didn't know so that's been played over and over again now because he passed away yesterday and he and he was kind of roundly ridiculed for that statement although of course it's quite a clever statement and i must say one he did not make up so it's, it had been around for a while the earliest version of it i know of although i'm not positive it's the earliest version actually appears in a very spiritual poem by D.H. Lawrence in 1917 called um, Heaven and Earth, I believe it's called. It's a long narrative, and it speaks of, it, 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 its subject matter loosely is the transition from this plane to the next plane, whatever that plane might be. And, and uh, towards the end, there's a stanza that says, and there I was, my hand outstretched, touching the unknown, the real unknown, the unknown unknown. And so if we think ignorance, for example, or the unknown is an important part of science, which I think we, I do, obviously, having written a book called Ignorance, then how do you get to the really deep ignorance, not just the unknown, but the unknown unknown, the stuff we don't even know we don't know? And I would say one portal to that is failure. So you do an experiment to find something out that you didn't know, some unknown thing that you, you knew you didn't know, you're going to do an experiment, and the experiment fails. So now you know, well, there was something you didn't even know you didn't know that you failed to include in that experiment. And so you have to go back and think some more. And so I think failure is this portal into the unknown unknown, into the deepest kind of unknown, the deepest kind of mysteries. And so that's why it's valuable, not, not retrospectively because it leads to success. And I think that's what Gertrude Stein meant, that, it, that it's an end in itself. Now... I then, That's a wonderful sentiment, by the way. I, I love the way you articulated that. And um, um, could you also tie it in? You know, I know this is we're speaking from a scientific perspective, but obviously on a on a societal level, on a, on a personal level, that has great ramifications as well. Well, yes, I, I, and I think at, at the personal level and and the social societal level, as well as a scientific level, one of the things that we um, that we often, I believe, underestimate is how much failure is acceptable. Uh, we, we often think that something to be avoided, and, and of course, my suggestion here is no, you don't avoid it. It's, um, it, it, it can be of great value. 
Um, so I like to use, I mean, there are many examples I could use. I like to use evolution since I'm a biologist. So you think of the, those super predators that are at the top of the food chain, you know, evolution's big winners, the lions and top big cats and, and killer whales and sharks and I don't know, raptors and things like that. And, and you, you probably think as I did to tell you the truth that, um, anytime they get a little hungry, they just go out and bag themselves a little snack, you know, a rabbit, a deer, whatever it prey animal they can find. But in fact, there's a vast literature on this, the predator prey literature, it would be called. And when you look at it, you find out that these, these, you know, great predators are in fact successful in fewer than 25% of their tries. 75% of the time they fail to actually capture the prey animal. And yet they're the top of the chain, they're the top of the food chain. So you know it's baseball season now. We're having a season and you know great baseball players who hit 300 as we call it, the batting average of 300 means they're successful three out of 10 times and fail seven out of 10 times. And then they get a $14 million a year contract. So that's not bad, right? So I think we underestimate significantly the amount of failure that's acceptable. And in fact, I would say, go so far as to say desirable. And that by doing that, we, we fail to fail enough, if you will. <clears throat> and obviously your contention is it's the failure that propels scientific discovery and scientific knowledge in general. And without the failure, we wouldn't get there. So it's part of the process and a necessary part of the process. Yes, I think that's a very well, well <laughs> said. Yes, and so then the question is the Beckett quote, which is how to learn to fail better. And, and that's what we don't teach, of course. That's the problem, I think. Um, you know, your daughter is taking chemistry and she's gonna take a test and then she's gonna either pass or fail that test. And that's a mistake, of course, um, because should she fail the test, the, the answers that she gives that are the wrong answers, so to speak, could turn out to be quite as interesting as the right answers, or at least the reasons for her wrong answers um, are likely to be just as interesting as the re or more interesting than the reasons for her right answers. I always think of the famous Tolstoy quote about why he writes about unhappy people and, and Anna Karenina, I think he says, well, you know, the trouble is, I'm paraphrasing, the trouble is that happy people are all happy in kind of the same way, whereas unhappy people are unhappy in their own individual, many, many different ways. And I think that's true. Success is rather narrow and defined, but failure, wow, I mean, there are endless ways to mess up. <laughs> you know, in just thinking about that, and I wanna pivot in a second towards optimism, but um, you, you're, you're familiar with uh, Evil Knievel, the stunt guy from the 70s? Oh, sure. I don't so know what old, happened to him, but I, I don't know if he's still with us, but the he only has one record at all in the Guinness Book of World Records. You know what that is? <laughs> and I assume now it's the number of times he fell <laughs> and cracked. It's, a, it's the number of broken bones that a human being has wow. ever had, apparently, on record. And so he never he never succeeded in any of those jumps. Um, he was he like failed spectacularly and he became one of the most iconic and entertaining uh, figures at least of that era. Um, so it's, I think that people would have, would be so much happier if they reframe things in the way that you're suggesting, where failure is an opportunity to learn. It's, uh, it, it's representative of uh, a diversity of thinking and, and creativity and, and many other things. You know, if people, if kids got their, their biology and chemistry tests back and weren't depressed about it because of their score, but um, were able to be empowered because they had thought in a creative and new way. I think that would be incredible. I don't know if um, that's ever going to happen, but um, to the degree that we could do that, I think we'd all be better off. And I think maybe speaking of that, you know, let's talk about being optimistic, you know, um, which is something that you've been thinking about recently. And I did, I mentioned to you that I uh, saw several of your uh, videos online, which I encourage people to go and just YouTube them. Um, very fascinating stuff. And you mention that Voltaire is the first person to use the term optimism, which uh, is in the 18th century, if I'm not mistaken. 1759. Okay. And, um, and part of your thinking suggests that progress gives rise to optimism. And you mentioned that the Greeks had no word for progress and had uh, what you describe as a circular version of the world. And I wonder if you could talk about that for just a moment. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I, I should point out that this is a complicated or at least um, 
uh, what's the word for controversial, I suppose, area in philosophy, and in particular in philosophy of science, the idea of progress and what it means and all the rest of that. So, but I'm, I'm gonna try and skirt around all of that and, and have a much more simplistic view of it. And actually, it's not so much progress, I think that's important, but what I would call the idea of progress. So, uh, I mean, if you, you know, if you think back through history, um, I guess most people think that progress is something that human beings have been making since, you know, the Stone Age or since we started agriculture 40,000 years ago or something. And, and that's largely true, but it's been very slow going. I mean, the Bronze Age lasted, you know, 2,500 years, 2,000 years. That's 50 generations of people who, for the most part, with brains just like ours, by the way, modern human beings, um, but for the most part, were born, uh, grew up and perished in the same technology. Uh, almost nothing changed. And so there was progress, but it was fairly minimal. So I don't mean to say there was no progress before science, but but somewhere around the beginning of the 17th century, the early 1600s, late 1500s, early 1600s, Francis Bacon, Galileo, Descartes, people like this began this thing that we kind of call the scientific revolution. Another, I must say, controversial term among scholars, but for shorthand, we all kind of recognize that there was this moment in uh, in Western Europe when a bunch of old white guys, I'm sorry to say, uh, got together and devised this kind of new way of thinking uh, or or put together a bunch of old ways of thinking in ways they never had before. And, and over a period of a few hundred years, well, I, I don't, it's pretty obvious the kind of progress that's been made, the way progress has accelerated in, in just the last few hundred years. And it's not so much, again, that that progress is for the good or for the bad. Some of it's been good, some of it's been bad. I mean, we hate the bomb, but we love anesthesia and, and all of that sort of thing. So yes, that's all up in the air. But the important thing to me is that progress becomes an idea. It becomes a palpable thing that we all experience. And that's actually not something that has gone on, in my opinion, through the whole existence of human beings on this planet. For the most part, things went very slowly and there was no real idea of progress. And that's reflected, sorry to go on uh, maybe too long here, but, but that's reflected a bit in what are for many, uh, many religious cultures, many uh, <laughs> philosophical cultures um, and theologies, a relatively circular view of the world. You know, you don't, progress doesn't come in a circular way. The Greeks believed that things recurred. Uh, that was part of their philosophy. The circle was the perfect shape and so forth. And that's, that's true to a large extent of Hinduism, of Buddhism, many other theologies and philosophies uh, have this notion of recurrence and circularity. And that's very hard to work into progress, right? Progress is a kind of a linear thing. And so, um, and so you don't really have a sense of progress as an idea in these earlier or in other cultures. So that's fascinating. And um, I just wanted to share uh, one photo out of two that I happened to snap uh, driving um, in Midtown on 42nd Street last week, actually. Um, the first one is, uh, is what's called the Isaiah Wall, which is across from the UN. And, you know, in, in so these two pictures I took, I knew I was going to be speaking to you. And I don't know if we have, the producer has this picture. There we go. Um, so you're familiar with this quote from the, the book of Isaiah? Yeah. Yeah. So this this to me is a version of non-circularity. You know, this is um, a, an example of the belief that there's an end point to history. You know, like there's like an apex that's that's something to be arrived at, which I just thought was interesting to contrast against the uh, the, the other circular notions that <clears throat> at least from a Judaic vantage point, it seems to me that there it's more linear. It's more the you know, there's there's an era of uh, striving and becoming, and then there's an era of sort of being and arrival, um, which is reflected by the, the prophet Isaiah, which is 2,600 years ago. So I, although I fully agree with you in terms of the industrial revolution and scientific progress, which has happened in the last couple of centuries, but I do think that there were some philosophical ideas out there that, that did hold that there is a kind of progression towards something greater. But the, the question that I wanted to ask you in the here and now was if there is currently progress and progress leads to optimism, why would you say that at this moment when we've got, uh, we've got perfect 
coffee at Starbucks and you can sit there with your your iPhone 8 and and be on Spotify and have every song that's ever existed in the world and you can watch your Netflix from here to kingdom come. Why is it that that did not give rise to optimism per se as reflected by the increase in anxiety, suicide rate, depression, and opioid use? Like, in other words, if we've progressed and, and that progression should lead to optimism, why are we so unhappy? <laughs> well, so first of all, I'm, I'm not sure that we're entirely unhappy. I mean, we, we, the standard of happiness and unhappiness is a sort of a moving bar, it seems to me. I, I mean, I think we're still, I, I would hazard a guess that um, unhappy though we may seem in the ways you just said, we're still happier than serfs were in the 12th century. Um, I think we're still happy, yeah. right? So, so you know, <laughs> if we can always find something to complain about, that's certainly true. We can always find ways to be slightly unhappy. Um, and, and in some ways, of course, I think we're, we're unhappy because we recognize that we could be better, um, which is not necessarily a common idea throughout history either. I mean, I think from, for, again, in many cultures and for many years, you know, people grew up and did pretty much what their parents did and assumed that their children would do pretty much what they did. I think there's some record, actually, of people, uh, middle ages, I suppose. Most people never ventured more than about 12 to 15 miles from the place they were born, from the right. place they were born, you know. And uh, you just didn't do that. I mean, and, and these things just went on and on in, in that way. There was there really wasn't any thought of, of something better. So. Yeah, you know, we have all these things at Starbucks and all, all these other gadgets and cures and things like that. And yet we, we find ourselves having a certain kind of anxiety because I guess we also have now been treated to the fact that, you know, if you will, like I shouldn't be quoting this, you should, but like Moses, we can see into the promised land. And so, you know, it seems like things ought to be better right over the hillside there, right? And why aren't we there yet? Um, and so I, I, my, I mean, I, I'm much more of an optimist than that. I'm not unhappy with the way things are in general. Um, I, you know, we're having a tough time of it right now, but I don't, I don't think things are worse. I, I, I had the opportunity a little while ago before the pandemic to speak to a group of cardiologists. They asked me to come talk about failure, in fact, at a cardiology meeting, which I was a little loath to do. I think cardiologists might be an exception to, to the rule of failure is a good thing. But in, in any case, they, the meeting was in Venice. So what was I going to say? No. So, so I went there and I talked to them about failure. And then we had a workshop afterwards. And somebody brought up that there are, you know, so many, so many things we should be worried about, climate change, et cetera. So, you know, all the, all the things, all the normal things that, that we hear about that, that should leave us depressed and think that things are worse. And I, I, now I had a room full of physicians or at least people in the medical field and I said to them, so is there anyone in this room who would rather be sick 25 years ago than today? And of course, no one raised their hand. We're all, better off. we're all better off today than we were 25 years ago. And we'll be better off 25 years from now, I believe. Now, there's no guarantee of that. We might not even be here 25 years from now. But, but given the past 25-year segments, I'd say every one of them has been better than the one before on balance. Not for everybody, of course. And, and not entirely. And it's not as though it's all hunky-dory and rosy. I mean, so when I talk about optimism, I also don't mean a kind of naive optimism or a gullibility or just the sort of, you know, uh, it's the best of all possible worlds idea. I don't, know, I don't think that's a very useful kind of optimism either. Um, and so I don't mean that, but I do think things are generally better and things are likely to get better. Um, could they be even better? Of course. I, I, the phrase I like to use about optimism that I think we can use now that has not been available to human beings even a couple of hundred years ago, I would say, is we can say about things, it could be otherwise. Now, it could turn out to be worse, it could turn out to be better, but we know that it could be otherwise. We know we have it within our capability to make things other than they are. We do not have to just accept what is. So might it, so be, might fair it be fair to say, to say oh, oh Nicker 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 there? Um, uh, I did that. No, okay, that, that progress provides you the opportunity for optimism. Um, but that, you know, it's your perception. You know, you could have all, all the wealth and material comforts 
that the, the world has to offer and just still be a, a miserable person, unfortunately. But, right. um, but progress, progress gives you the gives chance, chance to have a different kind of life. Yeah, I, again, I would say not just so much progress, but the idea of progress. Because again, progress is it's a tricky subject. I mean, if you talk to, if one day you have some philosopher of science on and you talk about progress, you'll get quite an earful, I, I guarantee you. Um, so, so for me, it's not progress itself. I mean, although that's there, but it's the idea of progress that we entertain. That and and I, of course, like saying you know, science is about ignorance. It's about the unknown. There's a certain triviality to that because it seems so implicit in our lives, and we've gotten so used to progress that the idea of progress doesn't seem like such a big deal. But I think it's quite often useful to take ideas that we find that we have implicitly we think we understand and then make them explicit and, and really analyze them more carefully and see if we can, I like to say complicate, I'd like to complicate the idea of, pro, of optimism and of progress, not make it simpler because I think, we, I think we, we've let those words stand for too many things, too many different meanings, everything from sort of cheerfulness to mindfulness to self-help sorts of things. To, and, and they're deeper, I think more important and better meanings for, for words like optimism and progress. Yeah, I think that that's very well said, and uh, I like it very much. But let us let me ask you, you, you break down the scientific revolution and its origins, and you, do, you emphasize that it's complicated and there are many different factors, and we don't know exactly what started it. And um, one of the figures, and you actually just mentioned him earlier, is Francis Bacon. And... You quote him saying what I think is a very fascinating thing, uh, that there was a change that happened at this time philosophically, uh, which is instead of truth coming from authority, that authority must come from truth. And that's what part one. Part two is you say that science is not seeking absolute truth, rather provisional truth. I wonder if you can explain that to uh, to our audience for, for just a minute. Yeah, so, so let me just point out, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Francis Bacon quote. It's a little bit of a paraphrase, actually, but um, and it's tucked away in one of his massive books. I just honestly happened to stumble across it. I think it's the luckiest stumble I've had in a long time, because I think in those few words, there is such a big thought, um, because up until that time, of course, truth did come from authority, whether it was the church or the state or Aristotle, and Bacon simply said, no, that won't be the case anymore. And and I, I think you could make a case for saying that that uh, with that statement, and he, he in some way started the, the scientific revolution, and, and the first result of that was, was the creation of a massive amount of ignorance. Suddenly he said, well, we actually know nothing. We have to figure it all out again. We have to now, you know, find out and how are we going to do that? So, and it was Bacon who kind of invented the idea of experiment. Another one of these ideas that I think most people think well, it's been around for forever. I mean, since we were, you know, drawing things on cave walls, people have been screwing around with stuff and experimenting, but we don't really experiment. I don't mean trial and error. I don't mean experience, although it's related to that. But an idea like experiment is to really, to probe deeply, to take a piece of nature out of its natural setting, to probe it deeply. And, and actually Francis Bacon said, torture it, believe it or not. And, um, and then believe that we'll learn something about nature in its total context from that and learns. And, and we do, I mean, remarkably that works. That should not work, I think. So the idea of experiment itself is, is a complicated one and a new one as well. But again, one that we just think has been around for forever. So, so that's very important. And then this notion of provisional truth, which was, uh, I'm not really quite sure I, you can ascribe that exactly to Bacon, but I don't know exactly who you can ascribe that to at the moment. I mean, there are people writing it. There's a wonderful philosopher of science named, um, right, her name just slipped right out of my head, Catherine Elgin, sorry, Catherine Elgin, who wrote a book called True Enough, which I recommend very highly. It's, a, it's, it's meant for a kind of a popular audience in which she talks about the fact that science produces, um, produces provisional truths. I mean, I think science just goes from being wrong to less wrong. It doesn't really, doesn't necessarily go to being more right. I mean, that's not the purpose of it, really. We're just trying to be less wrong. Um, I mean, an example for that could be the Copernican idea, right? So, so we know that that uh, yes, uh, the planets uh, go around the sun. The Earth is not at the center, but rather the planets go around the sun. 
But of course, for a long time, it was believed that the planets made circular orbits around the sun. Well, that's not true, of course. They make elliptical orbits. That was Kepler's big discovery. And that turns out to be very important because otherwise Newton could never have figured out everything he did and so forth and so on. So, but it's clearly less wrong to believe that the planets go in circular orbits around the sun than it is to believe that they go in orbits around the earth. So, so circular orbits are wrong, but they're less wrong. And then we can be even less wrong by getting to elliptical orbits and so forth and so on. And so I think that's what, what science does. Um, and and, and it's, it's a wrong idea to believe that science is, is in the business of truth with a capital T. <clears throat> so that's based on that, if there's only provisional truth, does that make authority also provisional, you know, meaning is, is there any ultimate authority, you know, and, and what are the, what are the outgrowths? What, what, what happens as the result? I mean, I think, you know, of, of holding that belief and you, I think you will rightly tell me, look, it's not, it's not a belief. This is just what it is. Like we, we do our best to understand what's what. And based on that, we, ad we adjust our understanding of what's true. Um, but based on that, does, does and can science have anything to say about tr absolute truth and morality? Does that play in at all? Would you say that science is in the business of trying to understand that, or is that is it wholly separate from the scientific endeavor? Um, I wouldn't say it's wholly separate from the scientific endeavor. I think science has a contribution to make, just like art and philosophy and theology and all of those human activities, law and so forth, have to make to those kinds of questions. And those are deep and difficult questions, and I don't think you're going to get an answer from any one place. And and um, and I wouldn't want science to be the the. I, 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 right now we're in the middle of this you know pandemic and the vaccine thing, and you hear all these people saying follow the science, follow the science, and I just cringe every time I hear that. I have to say. So, so do I. Yeah, it's just it's so wrong. I, I mean, and any good scientist should cringe at that as well. Um, we're we're not an authority. I mean, we're, we're, if if science is great about anything, it's being anti-authoritarian. And so to suddenly take the role of authority is a huge mistake. Now, I mean, I believe in expertise. I think it's useful to have experts. But, you know, the, the logical result of believing, of following experts, of believing in expertise is to never think for yourself. I don't think that's what we mean either. I don't think that's correct. So, so it's, I mean, there's no easy answer to this. I, I don't have a formula for it, but I, I would say science is an interesting part of it. And I will point out, by the way, that, that science is the newest kid on the block. I mean, when I say theology and art and philosophy and law and politics all have that to that, I think we should recognize that those are systems that human beings have used to organize knowledge for millennia. Right. Science has been here for about, or at least modern science, the way we practice it today, has been here for about three or 400 years. So it's still kind of the new kid on the block. So, you know, I think we need to give it a break now and again. It's just not going to be as mature as some of those other endeavors. You, you say in one of the videos that I saw um, that scientific optimism is the uncommon coexistence of hubris and humility, which is a phrase that I just loved. And, and maybe now is the time to, dis to show the other picture that I took um driving up 42nd street so th this this is a billboard that i saw that says science wants to cure people more than any disease wants to exist <laughs> <laughs> and i i wondered what you might think about it um you know you i love the the concept of the balance of hubris and, and humility and I, I agree those two things must be in harmony um it's sometimes sentiments like that 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 uh, seem to lean a little too heavily on the hubristic side. Um, and I wonder, do you, do you think that science is, is out of balance at the moment? Um, I think that science is, this is, this is a slightly tricky question, trickier than it sounded. Um, no, I don't think science is out of uh, balance at the moment, but I think the way we communicate science to the public and the way we teach science to the public, to, to those people who are not professional scientists, is out of balance. So that, and that's a serious problem. And I think that's one of the things that gives rise to the current mistrust or ambivalence or even malevolence directed towards much of science. 
Um, and it, I mean, some of it's just the result of nefarious players doing greedy and bad things, but, but some of it is legitimate, I think. And, um, and that I think is because we, we continue to kind of teach and communicate a brand of science that really belongs to the 19th century and before. And that's a kind of science that, that did suffer, I believe, from hubris. Now, I forgive it that a bit because uh, I think when science started, if you will, I mean, in the days of people like Bacon or Galileo or Newton, there had to be a certain kind of hubris that we actually could figure out. The, you know, I mean, what these guys were after was really to understand the mind of the creator. Right. They were all relatively uh, religious people or pr practicing some sort of deism or theism or something like that. And their idea, I mean, they were called natural philosophers. You know, the word scientist didn't appear until 1833. So, and their idea was to, to kind of expose, if you will, the mind of the creator so that we could see the greater, this greater good, this greater mind. Um, but this, this eventually wound up. So, so you need a little bit of hubris to come into the lab in the morning and think, yeah, yeah, I could figure this out. Right. I, I, so I forgive them a bit of that. And, and for a long time though, there was also humility because every time you answered a question, you realize you, you only made up 10 new ones. Uh, there were 10 new questions to ask. And so the more you knew, the more you became aware of what you didn't know, if you will. And so there's a certain humility in that. I think that got out of balance a bit. This is my own sort of history of science idea. Um, I mean, I think there are other people that may share it, but but I don't, I don't want to pretend that I'm saying this on some sense of authority beyond myself. I think that got out of balance a bit in the mid- I don't know, from the mid 1700s to the mid 1800s, when, when things became far more hubris, like hubristic, when science believed that actually the world was a kind of a clockwork machine, that we could predict everything, that it was deterministic, that if we only knew the formulas, which we would know one day or could know one day, then we would be able to predict everything. And this is a kind of a determinism that I think is actually quite dangerous. Uh, first of all, I think it's very pessimistic. I mean, if everything is all figured out already, if it was all set in motion way back when or whenever it was, and it's all set, then if you just, you know, write down the equations and fill in the, fill in the starting conditions, then everything that happens has been predicted. Well, that's kind of pessimistic. And indeed, there's an interesting branch of, of psychology right now, which is uh, suggesting that um, people who are depressed suffer from an over... Uh, uh, what would you call it, S suffer from a, a too too much of a belief in certainty. So so you wouldn't think that, right? You'd think that uncertainty is anxiety producing and all the rest of this and gives rise to all our psychological problems and so forth. But actually, people who are depressed are overly certain about things. They think everything is settled. I mean, they, you know, yeah. want to be the way it is. And so you lose a sense of agency. And that leads to a kind of a pessimism and, and a kind of a depression. So actually, there's something to be said for uncertainty, which will get me to this last point, I hope. So, so I think science at some point had within it almost the seeds of its destruction. I actually think science almost went away, if you will, in Western culture in the mid, near the mid-1800s with these, this exceptional kind of deterministic view, which was all hubris and almost no humility. That, I think, was ended, or at least the beginning of the end of that, was Darwin, actually, who showed um, that you can get tremendous organization and complexity from what is essentially a random set of events, ran total randomness hooked up to a feedback loop, if you will, which he called natural selection. And, and that eventually, I, I think also, you can make a good historical case, bled into the other sciences, which began to embrace uncertainty rather than this deterministic view of the universe. And so we have you know, quantum physics and relativity, statistical thermodynamics. I don't mean to throw all these phrases around. I mean, these are deep, deep areas that I don't understand entirely either, but they're all based on a kind of fundamental uncertainty. And what science has learned to do, I think remarkably, is to embrace that uncertainty, to make use of it, to, um, to if you will, navigate the waters of uncertainty and still get to a destination, still get somewhere, still, you know, like a helmsman in a boat with the unpredictability of water and wind, nonetheless can steer a course, can navigate these, these powers. And I think science is beginning to learn to do this. And this, I think, restores the balance of hubris and humility. But we don't communicate this. We still think that scientists are authorities, that they have an answer, that, 
when you ask them a question, they should be able to tell you this, that, or the other thing. And this is, I think, problematic because it's a promise that we cannot, as scientists, fulfill and shouldn't fulfill and even, shouldn't even try and fulfill. It's a wonderful anecdote about Harry Truman. There aren't so many anecdotes about Harry Truman, I suspect. <laughs> but one of them is he, he uh, is reported to have said at some point, he, had, he was one of the first presidents to have a science advisor, actually, uh, because, well, it doesn't really matter why, but he had an actual science advisor as a not quite cabinet level position. And at some point he was reputed to have said, could somebody please find me a one-handed scientist? Because he would get advice from these scientists who would always end their long thing of advice by saying, but on the other hand, it could be this, which would drive him crazy as you can imagine. But that is the only legitimate view to take, of course. And, and we know that if you will, two hands are better than one. So why shouldn't we have a pluralism of ideas? even though it's more difficult to decide which one to take. Uh, I think that that is a critically important thing that you're saying, you know, that um, the uncertainty uh, that's that's been taught by people like Gerdel and, and Heisenberg and chaos theory uh, should produce fundamentally a, a humility. Um, and it's that humility that's necessary, I think, I think you would agree, to, to prepare to propel science. And as you said, you know, earlier in your talk, that there's a fragility to science, that it's, uh, it's not a guaranteed thing that we're going to have it in its form indefinitely. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. I mean, there, are, there have been many instances of science or what we would more or less call science, not quite exactly what we have now, but uh, you know, I mean, the Egyptians had a sort of science, the Babylonians, the Greeks, uh, um, the Mayans, etc. cetera. There may be civilizations we don't even know about that had some form of sort of scientific enterprise, and they just they disappeared. You know, the, the uh, Arab mm -hmm. Islamic culture was very famous for its science for a period of uh, several hundred years, and then uh, poof, it, it kind of disappeared. And there are lots of different reasons for this, and historians are all over it. But nonetheless, it, 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 there's no guarantee that it will stick around. And I think this brand of science that we have now, in spite of its international, global kind of quality, nearly disappeared in the middle of the 18th century, being eaten up by its own hubris and, and ideas of determinism. So <clears throat> you mentioned, you know, that there is, there's been science to some degree or another for a, a very long time, whenever the first curious person went out with, uh, you know, their hands, looked at the natural world and tried to figure out what was what, in, in a sense, it sort of started. Obviously, it wasn't formalized into its methodology until much later. Um, but we have a, a tradition in Judaism that, you know, Abraham, the patriarch, was a scientist of sorts. He was interested in the empirical workings of, of nature. And, and was also, like, like the natural philosophers, was looking to discover the creator and to, to come to know the creator through observing um, the universe. And sort of as a, as, a, as a last question for this wonderful conversation today, I wanted to read you a quote by the English cosmologist John Barrow, <clears throat> where he said the following thing. It's a couple sentences long, so just bear with me for one second. <clears throat> but he says... Did you ever wonder why, of the many civilizations that flowered through history, only one developed fundamental science? Excuse me one second. <clears throat> the Chinese, for instance, have an exceedingly ancient culture, <clears throat> yet despite technological developments quite early in their history and rocketry printing magnetic compasses, such inventions provoked no urge to explore natural regularities. Ingenuity and inventiveness failed to foment periods of revolutionary scientific change and enlarged intellectual horizons as they did in later Western society. Even the Greeks failed to produce any significant corpus of scientific and technical knowledge. They advanced in logic, philosophy, geometry, astronomy, but made no discoveries of the great code of nature's laws. And so the question that he's posing is, why? Is, is there a reason for the, for the apparent lack of curiosity of some of these cultures and why it is that Euro European culture with this rooting uh, in the, uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic seemed to produce this fascination with this aspect of reality and the desire to delve deeper into it? Do you see any connection between those two things? 
uh, I, I think there's, they're indelibly uh, connected in, in many ways. And I, I think there are people who are sort of working on this area. I mean, scholars who are working on it. But, but again, I think it has to do with the, the circularity of thinking in many of these other cultures, the, the desire for stability over change. So the Greeks really, they were not interested in progress. Progress was dissolution and decay. Stability was what one wanted. Stability was the thing to be sought after. Well, you, you're not going to get stability out of science, I have to say. I mean, that's science is the study of change, in fact, in many ways. So I think that's a, a great deal of it. And, and I do think that the Judeo-Christian um, uh, philosophy is what made science possible. Now, it took some time. And, and I actually think there's some people that, that believe it was uh, Christendom and so forth, and, so on, but as, and as you put it, uh, Judaism even before that with the idea of a beginning, a creation, a moment of creation, and then sort of an apocalyptic end point, at least in, in Christianity. I don't know about whether Judaism has quite the same apocalyptic idea. Uh, I sort of, you have a, we have a utopian sort of a vision yeah, for okay. the end. Yeah. Uh, but so, so at least there's a linearity here. I, I think what finally spurred science in the West and Western Europe was at least from from this connection to religion was actually in my opinion the reformation and the reformation did this because it was strictly anti-authoritarian right. it was against the authority of the church and that suddenly opened up the possibility of of, uh, of of refutation of authority in many other areas and then science jumped on that as well and and so i think it was you know it, it took a long time to get started and then it happened all at once kind of thing it just needed one little kick. And I believe the Reformation in an odd way was that little kick. But of course, that was all based on, as you say, thousands of millennia of, of, um, of preparation, if you will, of, of thinking that's different than what we see in, in uh, Asian or uh, Islamic cultures or things of that nature. <clears throat> well, um, Dr. Firestein, I wanted to thank you so much for being here. Um, this has been a very enjoyable conversation for me and one I've uh, really looked forward to. You, I think your insights are really valuable and articulated in a really refreshing um, and engaging way. And I really recommend to, to our audience that they go out and check out your books um, and um, your, your videos online, uh, which appear to be very popular. Um, and I wish you all the continued success in the world. And, and I hope you continue to promote that great optimism, both in the scientific world and the world at large. And thank you so much for being here. Well, you'll, you'll do the same, I hope. We're partners in this. Yes, absolutely. Let's do it. Great. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. Actually. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for being here on Beyond Belief. And please, once again, take a moment and click that subscribe button and stay abreast of all the great conversations that we have coming up and check out our archive for past shows. Thank you so much for being here. Good night.